I'm Wade Rosen, president of Ziggurat Interactive. So uh, we talk about what your company does for those who are unaware. So Ziggurat is a publisher of retro video games. So we'll either acquire or license the rights to old video games and then re-release them, remaster them, uh, reboot, remake, uh, create sequels, really whatever that specific IP qualifies for. That's interesting because you say like old retro video games and like people, I don't think people understand how many PC games were coming out at certain points in time that maybe completely got glossed over. Because when people think retro games now, they think, you know, Nintendo or even on the PC games like Monkey Island, Maniac Mansion, but those were all big hit games. There were a lot of games that did very mediocre or rushed out and people have fond memories of those and it's really hard to emulate those. So talk about the process about discovering these games and finding the IP owners and then remastering them. Yeah, well, you can't, you touched on an important, an important point there, which is, you know, there's just so many PC games out there. So uh, when you really look at the forum for releasing games, now there's finally one with, with, between Steam and GOG for putting out old PC games. Um, as far as actually getting the rights, that's detect it's just like this really old school detective work because very rarely do contracts exist. If they are, they're in, you know, they're they're in somebody's garage or they're they're like in, you know, they're combined with four other gigantic uh, boxes of papers and you just have to sift through them. But oftentimes um, the way it works is you just kind of file follow the trail of acquisition. So this company acquired this company, which acquired this company, which acquired this company, and it ends up at company B and you find the owners of that and you really go um you go and talk to them the challenge is oftentimes that's not all that doc that clearly documented and oftentimes the rights are split when that happens um I think that's where you end up with a lot of things like no one's li no one lives forever which is a really beloved game was never saw a re-release because the rights are split between so many parties so a part of where we we look and how we determine what to go after is really based on the viability of attaining the rights or having any real clarity around the rights. It's funny because some of your catalog includes games like Time Quest. And I remember seeing that game on my uncle's computer, but I was seven or eight. So I couldn't really, I didn't really understand how to play those types of games. But wow. there are a lot of people who grew up playing those games. And that's one of those games that's a kind of like part of a genre that was huge in that time period. And a lot of them came out and it could have gotten easily lost in time. You know? Yeah, Legend Entertainment is uh it's my personal favorite that i did those are um superhero league of Hoboken being probably my uh my favorite that of mission control but the that's really that's a great example because there's legend entertainment which was acquired by gt interactive which was acquired by infograms which is now atari which was you know which those rights were then sold to another company and then we acquired those rights from that company and so it's you know you can kind of you can trace it all the way back but it's 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 a lot of um, detective work and it's a lot of like finding documents and it just becomes it becomes pretty convoluted at a certain point in time. That's the is biggest challenge. Yeah, is, is it easier to obtain the rights and remasters to these games? Because I don't want to say they're like, they weren't popular, but they're not as popular as like some classic games that you saw in the same time period. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Um, there just are some that are, that are not possible. And then there are others, um, you know, it really depends where it ended up. If it ended up with EA, you know, it's just, <laughs> that's just the way it goes. It's not that it's impossible, um, right? It's just that like they want either, like yeah, officially they want so much up front. You're like, well, it's not worth it because it's going to sell like a thousand copies. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you know, yeah, you yeah. Have that research. You have that research there, so. It, it, exactly, and and even if it was like meaningful for them, what what's meaningful for a company like EA is very different than what's meaningful for a company like Ziggurat. And so even if you could put forward a really meaningful proposal, they just, they probably wouldn't look at it. I, And I, I, I shouldn't have singled out at EA. That's just, that's like that with a lot of large companies. Um, you know, the, the really the barrier to even have them look at something would probably be, you know, is it a million dollar plus project? And if it's anything underneath that, they're just not gonna do it. So that's why you see a lot of these, these IPs that are beloved just sort of sit there and languish and and not go anywhere because um, it's not worth it for the larger company. It doesn't move the needle at all for them to, to really examine those catalogs. No, you're right. And like for some other companies who share really nameless uh, for, for uh, what's it called, uh, slander, they usually want a, a large, like a huge upfront large cost and like maybe even 35% 
a huge upfront cost and like up to 35% return on profits or return on sales, which is almost half the game. You know what I mean? Just, just to get the license. So like, it's, it's difficult. Like it's gotta be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, oftentimes the terms are onerous. And I mean, in those moments we just, we just walk away because life's too short and there's a lot of, there's a lot of old great games out there. So. I know. I mean, one game that I would love to see completely remastered and it wasn't really, it was starting to teeter off the popularity level was uh, Monkey Island 3, right? It was done in a wonky custom engine, hand drawn. And, and, and I've, I talked to Tim Schafer every single time I see him. I'm like, he's like, Lucas, he's like, Disney has it. Like, there's nothing, like, they're not going to let that go, ever go, you know? So it's, in, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's funny how, uh, things like uh, people are willing to work with IPs and like want them to be re-released and then other people who just want to sit on it indefinitely just because they can, you know? Well, I mean, if you, like in the case of Disney, right? Like it might not even be that it would be so onerous or their, ter their terms would be so onerous. You just would have to put a project in front of them that the IP probably wouldn't justify, right? Like they're, they're like if you went to them and said, hey, I want to invest $20 million in making a new game and here's what it looked like. They probably would sit down and have a real conversation with you. But it, that's not what we're doing. Like, you know, that's at least not at this point in time. That's that's kind of out of the, out of our wheelhouse. So we've we've really focused on projects that we can, that are achievable, and then have made some strategic acquisitions over the last year. Blood Rain, A Boy and His Blob, with IP that we're excited to bring new entries out in. There's um, is it difficult? Like, have you ever found a game or or wanted to find a game that you really wanted to remaster or, you know, put it through your pipeline of your company? but couldn't actually find the code or couldn't find actually physical like disc that you could rip the code off of, but you found the rights and license of the person who owns it and all that stuff. And have you ever run into situations like that? I mean, it's rare to find the code. Like if you have, if you find the code, it's great. And then, but even when you find the code, sometimes it's in assembly, sometimes it's, you know, if it's C or C plus, like great, but most of the time it's in assembly. So sometimes the code's useful. Sometimes you can kind of use it as a blueprint to reconstruct, um, you know, reconstruct the game in Unity or something like that. But the codes, it's it's like really, like we've been tracking down um, the Darklands source code for a really long time. Uh, that's a personal favorite of mine. And I think that's a game that's really ripe for for um, iteration and, and have a lot done with. Uh, and it's just been a process. We think we we finally have it and we think we've found it, but but then we're, we're actually going to have to fly to that location. Uh, they, you know, it's in, it's in, it's on tapes. We're gonna have to like comb through the tape, <laughs> that back. I mean, it'll be a huge, it'll be like a week's worth of work just to get the source code, but it'd be worth it for, for a game like Darkland. So when we have the source code, we take it. Um, we haven't encountered a situation where there's been a game where we just can't find a copy of it and we can't do that. But we've had plenty of examples where we don't have code and we have a copy of the game and emulation is not possible. In fact, if it's Windows 95, for example, the chance that you're gonna get that running is pretty light. It's just, there's not a lot of it. And that's why you'll see a lot of DOS games come out, but you won't, and you'll see a lot of DOS games and more modern games, but you won't see kind of this, there's sort of this no man's land between, I want to say like 95 and 03, where it's just really, really tough to to get PC games out from there. It can be done, but it's tough. And that was one of the reasons you started your company, right? Because you were tired of trying to get these games to run that you wanted to play and they just didn't run right. Yeah, well, a slight variation. Like, yeah, I, it was a little bit more console based. I, um, I was, I spent, I probably had sunk about, so I had finished up uh, with the company that I was running in Colorado and, and moved, took a job in Minnesota and uh, starting there, but I had some free time. So I was digging into my old uh, collection and I love the Sega Saturn. It's like, I just had this really big soft spot for the Sega Saturn. And I was, so of course I hook it up to the to the TV. You know I get a converter, I do the whole thing, and it looked like somebody just dropped it into a blender and just like dumped it on the screen. It was terrible. Like the pixels were everywhere. It was it just looked awful. So you know I went on this. It became this huge process just to play Panzer Dragoon Saga and figure out how like what's the best way to play this thing. You know what is like what kind of upreser should I use? Should I go buy a CRT TV? And I realized that there was really not a good way to play any of these old classic games that I had. I mean, you can do it, but it's a huge, it's just like this huge commitment. And yeah, so yeah, you said you need either a CRTV or some like, you know, $100 yeah. adapter. And even then it doesn't look that good for the adapter sometimes. It's, and like, yeah, it's probably like more like a four or 500, you know, 200 and some dollar adapter. And then there's there's all these tweaks and I do it. I, I still do it, but I just realized in that moment, I'm like, this, this is 
ridiculous. Like there, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And why can't I play Panzer Dragoon Saga? Like I still can't. That would be an example of a game where if I were to make a top five list, I would love to bring that back. That's like right up at the top. And, and, and so, yeah, that was the real impetus. The, all these retro games that I love that uh, just struggle to play on modern consoles or modern PCs. I think they're making a remake of that actually that's come that was supposed to come out last year or maybe they did well they did they? they did panzer dragoon but i don't yeah. know if they did panzer dragoon saga which is this like weird shooter rpg hybrid that came at the very tail end of the life cycle yeah i mean remember i remember sega had that issue in the 90s where like they did the 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 add-ons and then like they started defragmenting their user base and they were releasing consoles so fast that people kind of fell off you know i mean they were expensive in the 90s you know what i mean you couldn't buy three of them as a kid which is who they were targeting to you know i mean i had a sega i had a sega genesis i couldn't afford the the top loader i couldn't afford the cd and then it felt like the saturn came out and the dreamcast came out and i was like i can't buy any of this (laughs) i know you're right backwards i was like a super nintendo kid and then for some reason, like picked up a Saturn at a like a pawn shop or something, and like fell in love with the thing. So then I bought a Dreamcast. So I kind of went from from like Nintendo to Sega late in the life cycle, and then switched over to PlayStation for a long time. That's crazy, but like uh, you know, going back to the like not finding code, a game that reminds me of like a game that was lost at time was like Gay Blade. I don't know if you know the history of that game a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah, something like that. Something like, uh, like, see, so you, it's luckily you don't run into situations like that that often because that's a game that was kind of, you know, made by a very super small to one person. You know what I mean? It didn't really have, I don't think it had like a massive release. You know what I mean? Like it's very isolated release. Um, but like, it sounds like you try to find games that either you're interested in or like people are interested in that are niche that like people really want to play. Like they, it may not be in the tens of millions, but it may be, you know, in the, hunt, in the six digit range, you know, and you try to bring that to the masses, correct? Yeah, I, I think a good example of that would be like uh, Crush, Kill and Destroy was a game that's, that, you know, we, we thought people would be interested in and we were excited to acquire that. And then when we released it on Steam, we were pretty shocked by the, by the response that's been there. I mean, that's, that's a game that I was aware of. I hadn't actually played, but have now had a chance to, I mean, it's tough as nails. Like you play it now and you're like, oh man, my RTS sensibilities are really down. <laughs> like, I, I like <laughs> forgot like all these quality of life things that just didn't exist back then. But, uh, but yeah, so we try and predict, you know, we try, we don't just try and, there is like a strategy to it, but then the real joy comes in releasing it and, and like seeing how it's gonna perform. Like there are ones that I'm like, oh, this is gonna do great. And then it kind of underperforms. And then there are ones that uh, are, are sort of odd, little, you know, kind of odd strain. I shouldn't even say odd games, but you just don't know when you release them. They end up doing really well and having a really strong audience. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the joys of it is, is uh, putting it out there and seeing what the world's going to think about it and what, what the world really wants. So like talk about like, I mean, Blood Rain was a really popular game back in the day. Like that's probably one of your most well-known titles on your site. Talk about how that came about, that relationship came about. Yeah, so Blood Rain was a bit different than the others. Um, And that it's definitely our most well-known IP. Um, And that came from a connection that I formed with uh, Jesse Sutton over at Majesco. And uh, well, and actually by that point in time, the the game was owned by a company uh, that he owned called Zift. And I, you know, formed a connection with Jesse Sutton, and we talked about it. And um, yeah, we were able to acquire Blood Rain, Evan Rising, and uh, later a Boy in His Blob from Jesse. And that's been that's been phenomenal. We got to work with Terminal Reality on that, uh, update those, fix a lot of the problems. I mean, Blood Rain and Blood Rain Two were were I want to say more infamous because they didn't have X input controller support. Mm-hmm. So there were these, you know, really detailed and drawn out uh, YouTube tutorials on like how to get a controller to work for Blood Rain and how to, and so we went back and, and I wouldn't call it a full master, it was a remaster, it was more like an enhanced edition. We worked with Terminal Reality to, to bring that out and that was super rewarding and now we're, uh, we're continuing to work on that and, and got a few more surprises for this year. What constitutes like, you know, either you doing an emulation, an enhancement or a complete remaster? Like when, when do you decide yeah. that process? Yeah, so it really is about the you know the the fan desire for 
a remaster, enhanced edition. Um, and also the, the whether we have source code or not matters. Like if we have source code, it's a lot easier to fix something up and improve it. And it just open up, opens up more doors. But yeah, at the end of the day, you kind of look at each title and you say, all right, is this gonna to appeal to a thousand people, 10,000 people, a million people? And that usually determines what you're gonna do. I mean, a, a good example would be Avoidance Blob, which is one of my personal favorites. I, I like love the Wii game that Way Forward did. So, you know, when we acquired that, we knew right away that we were gonna end up doing more with that. It was it wasn't just to keep that game on its current systems and and uh, let the series stop right there. So. So in those cases, you, you go into it with with the knowledge that there's more, but most of the time you kind of make an assumption about fan response and then test. And if it's really positive, then you just keep doing more and and you uh, and you get the joy of doing it again the, the next day because you, you release a successful product. Yeah, not to get too deep in the reads of like market consumer research, but like it's interesting because consumers will be very loud when they think they want something like a good example is i've seen a lot of tech at ces that's very cool as a prototype people are like i want that i want that and then when they realize that if they made it it would be a thousand dollars they're like completely not interested at all anymore but you're like of course everyone wants a ferrari for the cost of a civic but you know you got to be realistic though you know like it's a, a certain at a certain point in time that's a good point so there's a lot of noise right so it's kind of you're really trying to figure out the signal from the noise and yeah. um I think the best, I think that's why we try, unless we're really confident, like with Blood Rain or Boy Is Blob, we usually start on a, a pretty simple project that we we know is low risk. And, and a lot of times, even with, with the re-release projects, with the tech and getting them to work, especially if it's not emulation, we don't end up making our money back on that. But that's okay. You know, that's why we're, we try to put out four or five retro games a month now and, and get those onto platforms like Steam and GOG that they haven't been on before. Because for each, five games you have a couple that probably aren't going to you know aren't going to work we'll say 10 over 10 games you probably have a couple that aren't going to work a few that like make sense that like maybe you're in the, the development resources back and a, a few others that that do pretty well but usually at one out of ten you're surprised and, you're, and you don't you don't expect it and you say oh wow there's actually real demand for this and then that warrants you know a uh a remake or sometimes just a sequel or, or kind of a, a full reboot um, and so we've got a number of those projects in the works right now. So uh, I'm curious with the stay-at-home orders in the pandemic in the United States, has that affected your pipeline at all? Or have you guys, were you, you guys already used to working remotely? Oh yeah, we were entirely remote. So for us, it's been good. I mean, it's it's been good for the game industry in general, I think. And, and You've been ahead uh, of the game basically when all this stuff yeah, happened. Yeah, we, we got lucky. That was kind of a rising tide. And, you know, we were one of the ships on the tide. So really, you know, that's, that's positive and, and we're grateful that um, that it's we've been able to navigate that in the way that we have. But no, the team's been wonderful. We're all across the U.S. and and the development teams that we work with are all across the U.S. and Europe and um, and uh, yeah, the, the world. So uh, some in Australia. I'm trying to trying to think of all of South America. So it's 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 a big team everywhere. It looks like you guys are all over the place. It is. I mean, our team's pretty pretty light. It mostly focuses, like the actual core Ziggurat team focuses on marketing and sales, but the development teams we work with are, yeah, all over the world, and there's quite a few of them now. If you're allowed to say, is there any kind of IP that you really wanted to remake and it just wasn't possible either because you couldn't find it or they wanted too much money or they flat out said no? Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I can say one um, okay. that I, I would like love it's given up it just kind of was like at the moment it was a bridge too far was uh <laughs> tactics ogre um, okay <laughs> you know it's it's a, just a game that i like it's it's top three probably for me and um i love ogre ba i love the ogre battle series i think it's just i think what they did i remember playing that when i was in middle school and it kind of like it's like one of those rare moments where you see something you're like oh my god a game can be like this i didn't know a game could be like this and uh and then playing Tactics Ogre was just the the next uh, the next level for me. So, yeah, I, I tried hard on that one, and it the time you didn't work out. It just I would say it didn't happen yet, but I'm not giving up. So it's 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 like you said. It's interesting because it's like it seems like the IPs that are normally harder to obtain are ones that have kind of had a longer shelf life. That like you know they it might still have value, and so the company's yeah. like, well, we're doing something in 2016 with it. We might 
You know what I mean? Like this still has an associated value attached or in, in some cases, I'm sure maybe the original person who created it's like, ah, I want complete creative control over my IP, no thanks. I just, I feel like, I feel like your job is so hard just trying to track all this stuff. Like, I feel like that's the job. This is trying to track all this stuff down before you can even begin to figure out if you're going to, you know, make this into a full fledged product or not. Well, you know, you touched on something at the beginning of the interview, which is the larger the company that owns it, the more challenging mm -hmm. it will be. And it's not always because they, you know, they want, like, it, it, like it's an insurmountable thing. They just like, they want to know that the project's real. But I, the other reason is because of those companies, the, the cost of being wrong is much higher than the cost of being right. So let's say they're right and it made sense to sell the IP. Well, it's, you know, nobody really cares. It's kind of forgotten the next day, but let's say they were wrong and if somebody does something with that IP and then it's released and it does really, really well, I, that might cost somebody their job, like selling the IP and then another company taking that and releasing it. So, so when you, for really large companies, it's almost more of a, a fear of being wrong or, or missing an opportunity than it is of like um, making the right decision. And I think that's why most of the time we try and work with smaller companies or, or smaller or IP holders that are really concentrated in a single decision maker because it's, it's just easier and it's simpler and, and their motivation is completely different. Uh, so, so yeah, there's a lot of things I would like to do, but they're kind of wrapped up with with large companies and that's usually just a much bigger plan and strategy and, and you have to go in with a really large commitment in hand. Again, if you're allowed to say it's sort of been a licensor or a game that you've wanted to remake or remaster and like it was so casual as in like you just called the guy or showed up to his porch and he was like, yeah, you know, sure, whatever, man. Yeah, just, you know, it's fine. And like, was there any, were there any games you've done that were kind of like super cash? Like, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I wish, I don't think so. <laughs> You know, like maybe the guy who owns it is, is past so his son, he's like, I don't give a shit with you with the game. Like, I don't, like, leave me alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> what do I need I to sign? Say, I've heard of that happening. I've heard of it. it. It happens. It hasn't happened to me, but I've heard of it happening. Um, yeah, like I, I uh, you know, I'm good friends. Um, man, no, I don't think I, I, it's probably, or at least none that I can really disclose. Uh, that's a good question. I, I've, I'm sure there has been one, and it'll, it'll probably come to me. But, but as of right now, no. I, I, I will say, like, you know, there are a number of the development teams that we've worked with are people that have worked on previous projects. So that's one of the things we try really hard to do is, if somebody made the original game, if they're still developing games and working on games, we try to go back to them to mm -hmm. remaster or the remake or or whatever we're going to be doing with the product, and. That's been that's been really positive. I mean, those teams are oftentimes, you know, it's 20 years later. So to be able to return to their work and and uh, you know work on it after that time, it's kind of like a homecoming for them. And they've been, you know, almost pretty much every team we've worked with has been really easy to work with. And um, you know, we try to be good partners. And and we want. I know that there's some like sometimes with publishers, there's a bad reputation. And so we, we really yeah. try to be public good publishers and good partners with those developers. And and so I would say that's where I found, I've been like pleasantly surprised is returning to those development studios, their enthusiasm to work with the IP and just the, the work that we've been able to do. It's been way beyond what we would have expected. Now, in interesting, interestingly enough, where does like the shareware games come into all this? Like obviously, like, sure. Rise of the, like Rise of the Triad, like where do those sit? You know what I mean? Yeah, so so a lot of what you just described is Apogee and you know, the and then the, the successor to that, which was 3D Realms. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of them like Shadow Warrior and Duke Nukem and, and uh, Rise of the Triad have all kind of gone their separate ways and they're all sort of scattered out under the wind. But um, you know, that's, it's something I've been curious about. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of working on that right now, actually, where, where like all these old, shareware games went and, and, you know, Apogee was the kind of pioneered that and they, um, they released a lot of those titles, but I think, I believe that a lot of those titles were then owned by the developers. And so they're probably sitting with, um, developers and, and the original creators of those titles. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting part of the retro history that hasn't been fully explored yet. 
Yeah, because I know people have been clamoring, like supposedly been clamoring for a Commander Keen, like a real Commander Keen remaster. Yeah. Like, I mean, they released some mobile game, which is nothing you know, with the license, but not not the original game or anything like the original game. You know? well, and I want to say Commander Keen sits with, I, I, I can't remember who got that, but that's an example. Like all of those things kind of went in different directions and different right. companies on the various IPs and they're all sort of scattered about. But there's also a lot of things that sit below the, that level of, of, uh, of like shareware game that I think are kind of interesting and, and would like to do something with in the future. Uh, yeah, so like, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, there's there's so many, uh, like I said, games that may have been like before my generation that I just, you know, people may have missed or you look at something and you get the, the nostalgia feeling. You're like, I wish they had that and you know, People can get ROMs. It's not necessarily emulators. It's not necessarily legal or the best way. And some of these are impossible to find. You know, emulators usually for much more popular games. You know, not yeah. these like abstract ones that were around for a few weeks and then you know uh, left. Um, so like, I know what's next for like your company. Like, what are you guys working on currently that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in the first part about emulators and and things like like PC games, it's it's hit or miss. You know, if it's DOS, yeah. you know, you like DOS box can oftentimes. Be a good solution but pc games are really hit or miss and so that's one of the values that you know I, we tried hard to provide is especially with a lot of those later pc games streamlining that fixing fixing some of the just the big issues that they have i mean we have full-time developers that all they do is work on compatibility in, installing patches trying to get these things working listening to feedback from the community and trying to solve the the game breaking bugs that occur the challenge is like Sometimes you can only take it so far. Sometimes it's issues with the code too, and you just, and that's always like a little bit heartbreaking because you know you, you get some feedback and you're like, ah, oh, I want to solve that, but we just can't. So we, we try. I do just want to say to everyone watching this video, if you leave feedback, we will read it. We will do our best to solve it, and we're reading whatever feedback you leave all the time. It's it's we're all super interested in, in what people have to say about the games and any problems that are found in the game. So that's that's the first thing. And I think that there is, maybe this isn't the, the future for Ziggurat, but I do think that there is a eventually a future where, you know, even if you could pirate a game, oftentimes, you know, it's easier to buy it on Steam. Steam has released, and GOG for that matter, like they've released such strong clients that it's, even if you have to pay a little bit extra for the game, it's worth it because of how easy it is. And anybody who's, you know, set up a Raspberry Pi and gone through that whole process and, I, you know, there, there's like a, there's a paralysis that goes from having those 5,000 games right in front of you and, and really being able to navigate that. And so I I do think that, that that will come to old console games, but it's not there yet. Um, uh, as far as the future for Ziggurat, uh, you know, we're gonna keep releasing, uh, we're gonna keep releasing PC titles and old and uh, old console PC titles. We're, try we're trying to do about four a month. So that's part of our retro first Friday. That will be happening all through 2021. And then we we have, you know, one large um, release every month, sometimes two. And a lot of those are gonna be remasters of pretty well-known games. And there's a few remakes and even a few new IPs that are going to be coming out this year. You know, it's funny because like two games that, I'm not saying make these, but two games I can vaguely remember as like a really young child is The Incredible Machine and Pipe Master. Yeah, yeah. Like those are on DOS. And like, I remember I couldn't, like I was so young, I couldn't get to the game. Like I couldn't type on the keyboard to get to the game because <laughs> I didn't understand how it worked. And so like, you know, as a kid, you're asking your uncle or your adult to like, switch out a game you'd play it for 10 minutes and that's switch out another game it was like a it was a process like it wasn't just yeah, like absolutely. switch you had to come back in exit type in the command code let it load and you know what i mean like so my my, my adult uh, my uncle and my dad had very little patience for me when, when I, if i didn't want to you know play uh if i wanted to play computer games really quickly at that age but you know it's you know it's it's absolutely right like it's it's four months seems at a huge like a huge undertaking to do four retro games a month that seems like a lot of work I mean, the, the team, it's, it's really kudos to the team. They work really hard. And I mean, there's QA process, there's you know, marketing collateral. There's a lot of things that go into that. And, and like I mentioned, a lot of the games end up not not being commercially successful, but that's yeah. okay. Like that's, that's a part of the process. And a big part of this is also just, we want to show the community that we're, we're here. We're trying to differentiate ourselves from some of uh, the other retro publishers and really just show that you know, we're willing to, that this isn't 
it's not a fly in the it's not a flash in the pan company that we're really determined and and dedicated to uh, to that single mission of finding old games and re-releasing them, remastering them, remaking them, whatever whatever uh, makes sense for that specific IP. Yeah, I almost feel like I, I almost feel like if like some of the conversation could be like, look. I know you like the Stormlord IP. I know you want a lot of money for it, but you know, like it's gonna just sit there and people have emulators. So if you want to make something, like work with us, you know, like kind of a <laughs> we can help yeah. you get it out there in an official way. You know what I mean? Like I, I think, and I think a lot of times, well, a lot of times what the conversation also just comes down to is us saying like, hey, I know you really value this IP, and you know we do too, and look at what we've done with X Y Z. Look at how we've treated this because. Sometimes it's about money. Uh, when, you, when you're dealing with large companies, it's about money. Other times it's just, like you said, it's about creators who who do care about what was made in the past. And it's maybe the money's a component, but it's also, they want to know that it's going to be done well, that it's going to be it's done It's not right. the driving force. Money's not the driving force. Or not in all situations. Yeah. Yeah. But but there always is like, in fact, like I think that's one of the cool things about this industry that we, we all get to be a part of is, is for a lot of people, there is just a true passion to uh to like get their game back out into the world and as long as they can see that you care and that you are going to do the best you can to to put it out there and and to bring people to it then that's enough for them not so everyone where can people go to find more information about your company and the games that you have released yeah uh ziggurat.games great uh that's our uh that's just the the main website but it's pretty interactive we've really tried to construct it into a museum so as you go through you can find information about each individual game usually videos and and uh um, where applicable um additional titles that might be relative to that so yeah that's i think everybody's got their website we we've tried hard to like make it a value-added uh part of the business and then our steam page ziggurat interactive or our dog page 